Welcome to April's ECR Wednesday webinar, hosted by eLife, the series that aims to give early career researchers a platform to discuss issues important to you and your research career. Later on, we'll be putting your questions to them. To ask a question, you can type in the question box on the GoToWebinar function panel, or you can tweet us, we are at eLife Community, using the ECR Wednesday hashtag. Please also join us on Twitter immediately after the webinar, where we'll be continuing the discussion under the ECR Wednesday hashtag. Finally, I'd just like to let you know that we are recording the webinar and we'll make it available on YouTube in the near future. Now I'll pass over to Laurent. Um, okay, well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's um, ECR webinar, where we will discuss uh, career challenges for early career workers in bioinformatics. And so I'm using uh, bioinformatics as an umbrella term for computational biology, quantitative biology, data science, and biotechnology. And even other kind of related roles such as software, uh, research software. Uh, so um, I'm Lauren Gatto. I'm a senior researcher at the university here. And today I would certainly consider myself a computational bio biologist or bioinformatician. But in a previous life, I was um, a biologist with a lot of uh, wet lab experience. And so after my PhD, um, I moved into my um, first position where I was officially a bioinformatician, that was in, in, in this industry, sorry, for a couple of years. Um, and after that, I moved on um, to do a postdoc and then an, an SRA here in Cambridge uh, to study uh, proteomics bioinformatics. And so we have three guests uh, with us today. Uh, we have, um, and they will share their experience and insights into kind of career as bioinformaticians. We have uh, Titus Brown, Associate Professor at UC Davis and Genome Center. We have Aideen Culhane, Research Scientist at the Howard T. H. Chan School of Public um, Health. And uh, Mick Watson, the Director of the ARC Genomics and Research Group Leader at the Roslyn Institute at the University of Edinburgh. And I'll let them introduce themselves a little bit more uh, and kind of focus on what is important for today's talk. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, I think uh, maybe what, one point that would be useful um, to get at the end of this webinar is maybe to get an idea of some essential or fundamental skills that bioinformaticians or aspiring bioinformaticians should possess to be employable. And you know, once we have these skills, you know, once I have the skills, how can I uh, make sure that I promote myself to be employable? Um, we'll try to focus on um, challenges that we face in academia, in industry, in core facilities, or any relevant sector. For example, with the um, high, uh, the big, big growth, uh, the big success, the growing success of software carpentry and data carpentry, um, you know, what could wonder whether teaching bioinformatics becomes a career path on its own, or whether being able to teach bioinformatics is an important skill that young bioinformaticians should possess. Um, it might also be interesting to address specific aspects of, uh, of open research and reproducibility. Can I consider myself an employable bioinformatician um, if I don't master these tools for reproducible research? If I'm not able to kind of share my work openly, maybe very important. Um, we might also address specific issues related to inequality or underrepresented minorities uh, specific to bioinformatics. Uh, Mick, I, I think, uh, I believe, defined the concept of um, lonely pet bioinformatician uh, that I thought was, was very amusing and, and kind of you know, kind of broke as, as, a, a, as a real thing, which is the kind of bioinformatician that is embedded in the wet lab uh, on, on their own without mentoring and, and whether, uh, without any support. So what kind of online resources, online communities do we have to try to liaise with our collaborators around the globe? And maybe as an extension or as a conclusion of, of this webinar, um, you know, where we discuss the current challenges uh, in bioinformatics and, and jobs in bioinformatics, you know, we could also um, think a little bit about what's the future if, of bioinformatics related to biology. And maybe, as, as some people have said, um, is or will um, biology at some point simply become computational biology? Anyway, uh, for the listeners, please don't hesitate to interact, ask questions on the GoTo platform or on, um, on Twitter using the um, PCR Wednesday hashtag. Um, 
Oh, sorry, I have a slide. Could you quickly show me the slides I have? Um, there is also a Google Doc, and the link is at the bottom there on the slide. If you want to use it uh, to collaboratively take notes or you know, add useful links, please do so. Um, I'll try to clean it up at the end and maybe write a little blog post or share it more widely. Um, so I would like now to invite our first speaker, um, Titus, on the virtual stage uh, for him to share his thoughts and experience. Thank you. I, I thought you were going to do more with slides and stuff up front then. OK, well. All right, we'll see how it goes. Um, so, um, so uh, sorry, I'm in a hallway, so occasionally there may be doors slamming behind me and that kind of thing. Um, so uh, let's see, I think maybe I'll give a, a brief overview of how I, how I got to, to my current job, uh, which I think is um, interesting, mainly in the sense that, that virtually every bioinformatician or biologist I know that has um, uh, or a computational biologist I know that has sort of gotten to a faculty position has done so in a somewhat non-traditional way. Um, so I should say my, my earliest training in science was in physics, uh, where I um, did a lot of uh, data analysis uh, and it, simulations on evolutionary uh, simulations and modeling in sort of the digital life field. Uh, and then that got me really interested in biology, but my background at the time was in pure math, which is my undergraduate degree, and also in, in physics for, for my research. Um, and so uh, I ended up getting into an interdisciplinary program at Caltech in the graduate school there, computation and neural systems, which wasn't what I wanted to do, but had the advantage of being very flexible in its training approach. So I could take math courses, I could take bio courses, and I could work in a variety of labs. And I ended up in a developmental biology lab, um, where I learned all of the molecular biology that I know when I was doing experimental work in, in, this, in this lab. And I think one of my, the two formative experiences from that lab were, um, the first was sitting next to somebody who was looking at 500 sequences that had been output from a cDNA macroarray experiment. Uh, and they had developed this very clever approach where they were taking um, collections of Sanger sequences and concatenating them in a text editor and then pasting them into the NCBI BLAST website because that way they could get three sets of results at a time rather than rather than having to do three times the work to get the, the results. And I, I uh, moved over next to them and looked at what they were doing and I sort of understood roughly what they were trying to do. And I said, well, have you thought about running this at the command line? And they just gave me the sort of completely blank look like I have no idea what you're talking about. So um, I fairly quickly became valued simply for my ability to get the same kind of results they were already getting, but you know, a thousand times faster. Um, and so that was an interesting, that was like I was second year in grad school and I realized, hey, I actually have really marketable skills, <laughs> just, just improving current workflows. The other formative experience was um, developing a platform for comparative sequence analysis of non-coding elements in um, back-sized uh, genome chunks. So we were working in sea urchin, I was working in sea urchin genomics for my graduate work and we could get um, 100 KB chunks of DNA very, very easily for about $10,000 a pop from back libraries by screening for known genes. And we were interested in finding cis regulatory elements that is conserved non-coding elements between um, two different somewhat related CRP species. And there weren't tools that were really good at doing this that biologists could use at the time. And so I, I put a couple of years of work into building a web interface that let people set up analyses of the things they were interested in, and then visualize them and adjust sliders and do thresholding and that kind of thing, and then extract the results. And the most the, the formative aspect of that experience was after putting in two or three years worth of work on this, um, I stopped working on it and went and did some of my other graduate work. And then I attended a, a conference, the conference in the in the field, the sea urchin genome, uh, the sea urchin meeting uh, at the uh, at marine biological labs, and several different people from the community got up and showed results that they'd gotten using my software, without ever having had to talk to me. And I thought, okay, this is great. I don't like talking to people. I uh, I love getting result. I love helping other people, but it's challenging when you don't talk to them. So maybe if I write software that's relatively easy to use and I write tutorials, I can help other people get results, and I don't have to interact with them about it unless they have problems. And this seemed to me to be the most amazing thing ever. And so that sort of launched me in my um, 
trend of trying to write software that is relatively easy to use and then writing tutorials on how to use it. And sometimes that works out better than others, but at least it's it's been a consistent focus that has always yielded um, positive results for my career, I think. Um, sometimes five years down the road rather than two years down the road, but you know that's that's the nature of, of the academic career system. Um, so that's my experience, and I guess I should just say, um, from from Caltech, I went on to Michigan State, uh, where I sp I spanned two departments: computer science and microbiology, uh, and that was a very uncomfortable split. Um, the computer science department had very different ideas of what constituted career success than did the microbiology department, um, and uh, there was a lot of negotiation involved that culminated in me. Um, uh, applying elsewhere for for many reasons, but that was one one of the reasons. And I ended up um, uh, moving to UC Davis about three and a half years ago, where I'm actually a professor in the School of Veterinary Medicine with an adjunct appointment in the uh, Genome Center. And there, I am again a fish out of water. I'm in a vet school. Um, I don't I don't know much about veterinary animals. Uh, Mick would actually have been a much better choice um, for this position. Um, but uh, nonetheless, the, the department seems to be very happy to have me around. And I, I joke that, uh, only partially joke, that they seem to want to have me around for the purposes of having coffee to talk about what kind of sequencing they can do, what kind of data analysis they can do. And then they're happy to collaborate with my grad students and postdocs on that. But really, the first thing they seem to want to do is just talk in general about what they could do. Because they're not terribly, they don't keep up necessarily with the latest technology in this area in the way that I do. And of course, vice versa, I don't necessarily know all of their questions. So we, we just talk. So that leads me to uh, the two points that I wanted to make along the lines of this, um, of this webinar. And I think the two points are, one is that I think communication skills are probably the, one of the most important things when you're working in an interdisciplinary area like this. Um, generally, I find that Biologists don't immediately understand the implications of different analysis approaches, and vice versa. A different um, computational biologists don't understand uh, necessarily how the wet bunch biology has um, placed restrictions or guide. It needs to guide the way that the uh, downstream analysis, computational analysis, has to work. And that's generally not a situation where you can just be like sent a paper and you read it and you're like, oh, now I understand everything. There's a lot of negotiation involved, and that negotiation is is communication about why you might want to do it this way versus the trade-offs if you do it this way. Uh, and I've never failed to, I don't feel like I've ever been disrespected in those conversations when I've told the biologists involved why, how this impacts the results they're going to get from their data. Um, and, and so that's always the angle that I try to bring to it. Um, so I think good communication skills are really an essential part of, of, of any skill set when you're working in an, in, a, in an interdisciplinary field. And then the other thing, and I think um, the other thing that I wanted to suggest was workflow automation. Um, I've spent a, a, a ridiculous amount of my life typing things at the, at the shell prompt. I think that's true of, of anybody that's been doing computation for the last 30 years uh, in, in um, many fields. Uh, and um, a lot of what I do is really boring. It's running the same thing I ran last week and the week before that and the week before that. My grad students and postdocs have exactly the same experience. And um, now we're starting to have to do much larger analyses. We have dozens to hundreds of data sets. People walk into my office with 600 microbial genomes. They say, what can I do with this? And I say, well, do you know anything about the shell? And they say, no. It's like, okay, well, <laughs> that's where we're going to start, right? Um, I think that uh, basically, as data set volume sizes and numbers increase, those who automate the boring bits of the analysis are going to be the ones that, that can do something with those data sets. Um, so this requires really good automation skills, scripting, workflow development, and usually R or Python for data interpretation. Um, and I will just say that there's a, 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 a neighbor, a, a joined danger that if you get really good at automating things, you might end up only doing the bits that are automated rather than doing the critical thinking aspect of the data analysis, which is also necessary. Um, but you can get to that interesting bit faster if you automate the heck out of all the boring bits. So those are my two suggested skills. Good communication, and I would say that since we mentioned the carpentry is up front, um, this is something that the carpentry instructor training strives to teach. And the other is good automation skills. And again, the beginnings of that are taught in the Carpentries along with many other data science courses. So with that, I will, 
I will leave, I will transition to another speaker. Great, thank you very much. And I think the next speaker is Aiden. Thanks, Laura. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to um, contribute to this um, panel. Um, so I'll give a very quick background of where I got into bioinformatics. Um, and as many people who've been in the field for a while, I, there was no bioinformatics training. You know, there wasn't a master's or a degree program in it when I entered the field. Um, I originally registered in a chemistry program, um, which I didn't really take to, and so started exploring additional options and ended up doing a degree for all intents purposes was a biochemical engineering program. Um, we learned a lot of programming. We used VAX, we used Unix, we used Fortran. We um, learned mathematical modeling um, as well as really strange biochemical stuff that I've never used, like browning of lettuce, um, making chocolate, fermentation. And besides from the bar, that wasn't used too much thereafter, in my career at least. Um, however, what really excited me was when we got into proper molecular biology, the emergent genome sequencing that was really at the initial stages and where that would take us. And that more than anything excited me. And I did an internship at the time at Applied Biosystems where I worked in their um, QA department developing basically the DNA synthesizer sequencers and PCR machines. And I really learned there at the forefront, like some of the people there knew Carl Mullis, um, the guy who invented PCR. And there was a ton of excitement in the Bay Area at that time. Um, so I knew when I finished, I really wanted to delve into molecular biology and the genome and really explore what made us who we are. Um, so my PhD um, was actually in neuroimmunology um, and molecular biology of neuroimmunology, which sounds kind of complicated. I was cloning genes, doing PCRs um, in a physiology lab that was actually looking at the intersection of the immune system and the nervous system. So we were looking at how cytokines worked in the brain during which time I cloned a new gene, which we sequenced, and then we tried to predict its function and do biochemical assays to try and predict what it did. But I way preferred playing on the computer and ended up building all these models, evolutionary models of what it might be related to and predict its, its structure. And I, every time my PCRs didn't work, I was on the computer, like playing with every single bioinformatics tool that existed at the time and got very good at GCG and all those programs that existed in EMBOSS. Um, so after my PhD, I worked with BBSRC um, in the UK and I actually did bioinformatics training for two years. So basically a core facility and um, we supported all of the BBSRC institutes, including Roslyn, Herbright, um, Babraham. And there I really was introduced to a lot of different aspects of molecular biology from viral genomes to really predicting HLA functions to just standard, you know, plasma design. Um, so after my PhD, I actually moved back to Ireland and I did a postdoc with Des Higgins. Des Higgins wrote Clostal W um, and really came from there's a very strong evolutionary biology program in Dublin, all pretty much developed out of Phil Sharp's lab, but there's many, many labs there that work on evolutionary biology. So really got immersed in kind of evolutionary biology and then started developing um, statistical frameworks, multivariate statistics with a group on Lyon to analyze microarray data and look at kind of dimension reduction analysis for microarrays. Um, and we ended up writing software in R my conductor had only started a couple of years at that time and I released my first software with Bioconductor um, and have really stayed working with Bioconductor since then. I'm now on their technical advisory board, I'm on their meeting committee um, and heavily involved with R and Bioconductor. Um, I also run the meetup um, in Boston um, for R and Bioconductor. Um, 
after finishing my postdoc with Des, I actually moved to Dana Farber, worked with John Quackenbush for a while because I really wanted to look at genetics of cancer. And it was there I started looking at kind of multiomics data and trying to bring a lot of data sets together using dimension um, reduction and matrix factorization approaches. Um, and that has very much been my interest, this idea of bringing many, many data sets together and really trying to understand many cell types together. So I've got we've got a grant where we're looking at kind of tumor microenvironment effect. Um, and then we're also looking at sort of immune components within the tumor microenvironment as well. So the idea of taking that not just one cell type, but taking the cells around it, what's the crosstalk, how are they talking, and then beginning to maybe explore some of the, the local, the regional and the systemic um, impacts of cancer from a genetic basis. And towards that, we're also working within the Human Cell Atlas project very much to develop better ontologies and annotation. Um, for cell types so we can begin to understand what are the different cell types that are involved. Um, and really I work on pretty much any type of data that is there that can really help us address the biological models that we wish to do. We, we analyze CRISPR data, um, proteomics data, gene expression data, methylation, microRNA. We try to integrate that to really try to understand what are the genes and pathways that are involved. We developed a database called GeneSigDB, which we're not actively curating anymore, um, which is like a, a, which had 5,000 gene signatures, um, which we curated from the literature. Um, I think the most exciting component um, of our work is really that we are at the intersection of many different fields. Um, because so many people have come into bioinformatics from different disciplines, from physics, from computer science, from statistics, from traditional math fields, and also from biology. It's a really exciting ecosystem where many, many different thoughts and you know you know you talk to two people and they will have a very different idea of how to solve the same problem. So it's it's really um, stimulating intellectually from that perspective. Um, that's not without its um, surprising moments. Um, and as as um, I think everybody else will say, so communication is essential. And I can always remember the first time when I spoke to mathematicians and biologists, and we were talking about a model, a pathway model. And so one is going, well, where's the data for the differential equations? And the other started drawing like, well, this protein activates this protein, which activates this protein. And we have a lot of data, which they meant gene expression and the other one to time course. And nobody understood each other. Or the first time we talked about samples and microarrays to statistics and they're going, but what's the sample? And we're saying um, it's a piece of tissue. And they're going, no, that's not a sample. It's a, it's a population sample. Where's the population that you're sampling? So definitely um, to be aware of the fact that when you're talking to many, many different people, everybody has slightly different um, words and they can often mean different things. Um, at Dana-Farber, where I work, um, at the, the hospital, um, we, we work with as many mathematicians, physicists, statisticians, but we also work with clinicians who are seeing patients on a day-to-day basis, um, work with a lot of bench biologists, and that is always exciting and always new, and it's rapidly developing field, um, the, which is exciting. The, the other aspect of it is you have to be able to juggle many, many projects. Um, Quite often it's like one collaborator says, can you just do this one thing for me, which ends up being bigger than what it is. Then you have to manage your own time and your own methods development and your own public first author publications, as well as the collaborative papers, which, and these collaborations are vital because these are the things that you develop your models on and then you actually test your models on. And so it's, it's, it's at that intersection and in juggling many um, projects. Um, the final thing that I think that is pretty important is understanding where the data comes from. Um, I've seen way too many students trip up with the idea, I've got a matrix and I've got rows and I've got columns and, you know, I'll just put a linear model on this. I'll do Lima T-test and I'll say what's different between this group and this group. And 
I say, well, have you done exploratory data analysis on that, even if that's simple box plots or some sort of principal components or anything, just so you can get a feel for what the data is. And quite frequently, people haven't. Um, and then they realize that the Prince first component is actually some sort of technical artifact um, or that the samples are mislabeled or that the annotation in the matrix was um, excelized. So all of your genes are now one sept and four oct. Um, so definitely, I think a little bit of skepticism with data is very critical. The ability to find out where the data came from. Was this all generated on the same day? Who generated it? What are the failures associated with this um, data? And I think um, nobody has better talks and there's some very, very good ones on sort of data forensics um, from the team in MD Anderson. Um, Keith Balgerly has some very good um, ideas on that and how to actually really take the data and actually work out, is this the data we want to be analyzing and how do we analyze it? Um, and I think the final thing I just wanted to mention is we are seeing much bigger data sets with the single cell data that's coming out and with the growing numbers of genomes. Um, we're dealing with how to deal with data that we can't just load into memory. We can't just load into Excel. And I think we're going to see increasingly that bench biologists can't analyze their own data. Up to now with microarrays, it was pretty simple. Um, but with some of these really big data sets, you need, um, I think, more advanced skills. And so I think um, the whole problems of the, the pet bioinformatician, the one person working in the lab, is, is, is going to be more rather than less um, evident. And I think it's very important that institutes support those people. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Mick, are you there? I am here, yeah. You? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Very good. Great. Uh, my apologies um, uh, for not using the webcam. Um, uh, for some reason, uh, my laptop died, and so I've connected via phone. So um, uh, thank you very much for, for uh, inviting me to, to take part in this webinar. It's a real uh, privilege, and uh, it's great to hear from uh, Titus and Aidan, uh, uh, and I absolutely agree with everything they say. Um, uh, this is fantastic advice um, to everyone. So uh, let me just introduce um, myself to everyone who doesn't kind of know um, uh, where I'm at and where I've come from. So I'm currently at uh, the Rosin Institute. So I have a, a professorship here in uh, bioinformatics and computational biology. Uh, and I have a research group. Um, and we focus um, largely uh, speaking now on microbiome analysis. That's um, to be honest, uh, it, microbiome is something I'm very interested in, but the reason we focus on it is because that's what we've managed to get funded rather than uh, 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 the other projects, which I also am excited about, such as functional annotation and functional genomics, which unfortunately we didn't manage to get funded. So uh, that's a little insight into, into PI life there. Um, so my background is I, I did an undergraduate degree in biology, uh, followed by a master's in uh, biological computation uh, and at the end of that master's, I had a choice to either go on um, to do a PhD or to take uh, a job, and I chose to take take a job. So I had a, I didn't go through the traditional route uh, straight through PhD. So I took a job at, uh, in, in industry, actually, at a, a company called Glaxo Welcome, who were uh, one of the largest pharmaceutical companies at the time uh, in the world. Um, and to be honest, it, it was a support position. We were working with uh, researchers um, who had a really very early stage prototype of microarrays. So they were working on microarrays. Uh, it was pre-genome, so they, did, they didn't even know what was spotted on the microarray at the time. Uh, if they found a differentially regulated spot, they would cut it out and they would sequence it to find out what it was. Uh, and, and basically, we, I was part of a team that just did a lot of uh, support work around that research activity. So I started my life out very much as a support bioinformatician. I had a couple of jobs in industry uh, uh, working with microarray, microarray data and with sequence data. And then uh, in 2002, I got offered a job in, in academia, and that was my first real research role. Um, and so I still didn't have a PhD at this point. Um, but I was offered a, a, a PI position, a, a group leader position at a research institute um, uh, uh, between Oxford and Reading in the, in the UK, a place uh, at the time called the Institute for Animal Health, and that was a farm animal genomics research institute, and I've been in farm animal genomics ever since. Um, 
from that point, I mean, it was a kind of interesting um, uh, uh, career path. So uh, certainly my uh, career um, has, has always towed that line between uh, support and research. So, um, I mean, you may, uh, what one person's definition of support, it, it, it could be seen as collaboration. So is it support, is it collaboration? And I've been lucky to work with a lot of scientists who've seen that kind of me providing them with some statistical or bioinformatics help as a, as a research collaboration. And, and, and uh, I would advise everyone who, who ends up in that kind of role, in that kind of support role, if you do want to get into research, you need to start framing these interactions in terms of a collaboration. You need to start thinking about where you're going to be on the paper, and you need to have open conversations with people about what that paper is going to look like and where your authorship is going to be. Uh, and uh, it is definitely possible uh, from a support position to start carving out a research career and publishing your own papers, um, um, but you have to make sure that you can find time to do that. So, uh, I mean, that's pretty much what I did from a from a position of support. Uh, I, I kind of over time just kept on publishing research papers, either in collaboration or software papers of my own. And over time, then started writing grants and, and carved out a research position um, uh, for myself, um, and then moved on to other places. I joined Roslyn in 2010 uh, to run a research group, and I now have actually both. Uh, wet lab and dry lab people in, in the group. So we have uh, a bunch of people. I manage a bunch of people who, who work in the lab. We do DNA, RNA extractions. Um, they do library preps for sequencing. Um, uh, we, they do MinIN sequencing, of course. Uh, and then we have a bunch of people who also analyze the data. So uh, I finally got my PhD just in 2015. And then uh, a year later, I got my professorship. So that's probably the shortest time between PhD and professorship. Uh, uh, in living memory, I suspect. But um, uh, so, the, I mean, the things that I want to kind of, the points I kind of want to make on this kind of webinar. So let, let me tell you two brief stories um, which have been very influential uh, on me and which I think uh, uh, can help me get my point across. The first, um, first story comes from uh, an interview uh, for my first job at Glaxo Welcome. So the guy who was running the interview was a guy called Clive Brown. Um, so uh, you may know Clive Brown as the chief technical officer of Oxford Nanopore now. So uh, he wasn't that when I first met him. He was a, a bioinformatician at Glaxo Welcome. And uh, we had uh, a very nice interview. He was, seemed quite keen to employ me. And then he, he asked the question, do you know any Pearl? And uh, I hadn't even, so <laughs> you can tell the age of this. This was sort of 1990. Uh, when was it, 1997, 98? So do you know any Perl? I'd never heard of Perl. I could program in C and a little bit of Java. I'd never even heard of Perl. So basically, I then, I got the job and they sent me on lots of training courses to learn how to program in Perl, um, which is fine. Uh, and now I, I know how to program in Perl. Um, I guess, uh, uh, so let's park that for a little while. I'll, just, I'll let you think about that one for a little while. And fast forward to around about, I think, 2007. Um, by this point, I was a slightly more established kind of scientist in, in 2007. I was sat in a conference, um, which I can't remember the name of it. I think it was one of the big microarray conferences. Um, and uh, Mike Eisen was the keynote. And Mike was talking a lot about flies. So I, I knew Mike, uh, Mike's career really from uh, when he was doing microarray analysis on yeast, those kind of seminal papers on the yeast cell cycle when microarrays were first coming out. Um, but he was talking about flies and, and gene regulation in flies. And then halfway through his talk, he kind of just stopped and said, uh, by the way, um, for any of you who are out there who are working on microarrays, you need to stop now because they're dead. And next generation sequencing is going to take over everything and everything's going to be done by sequencing. Uh, and I was a little bit shocked by this because uh, basically my career up to that point had been on analyzing microarray data. Um, so the, the, um, hopefully you'll kind of start to get my point here in that, um, obviously, I think if, any, if you go to an interview now and anyone asks you if you know any Perl or urges you to learn any Perl, I would urge you to politely thank them and then get up and walk out of the room because Perl isn't really a, a language that you should be learning right now. I, I recommend to all of my, um, my staff and students and postdocs that probably Python is the thing they should learn if they're going to learn anything. Uh, similar microarrays. I mean, they're kind of not really the latest technology. And um, 
the point I'm trying to make is that the kind of skills that you need for a successful career in, in bioinformatics are not really technical skills. They're not kind of, because your technical skills are going to become defunct at some point. Knowing Python or knowing R or knowing Perl or Java, these things are going to die at some point and something's going to take them over. Similarly with the technologies, Illumina sequencing dominates uh, bioinformatics right now, but at some point Illumina is going to die and something else will take over. So um, the skills that are really going to make you successful uh, in bioinformatics are, are kind of more gen more generic skills. So some of the skills that kind of uh, Tidus has talked about, which is um, communication and being able to, to um, uh, produce workflows, reproducible workflows is a very powerful technology. And the kind of statistical skills that Aidan were talking, was talking about. So just having that, uh, that query in your head to kind of look at your data before you start analyzing it. Um, and, and some more kind of generic uh, skills in, in life uh, and, and in science, which I try to touch on a lot on my blog and in my blog posts, which are around um, uh, delivery uh, uh, and writing. So if you want to be a researcher, if you want to be an active researcher, then uh, I've got to say that the biggest skill you can learn is just writing. Okay, it's writing. I spend half of my time, if not more than that, writing. It's writing papers, it's writing grants, it's writing reports. Uh, it's, it, it, it's writing all sorts of things. And genuinely, if you don't like writing, then perhaps a, re a career in academic research certainly is, is perhaps not, not for you. Um, and, and the other thing I, I want to touch on is really just delivery. So, and, and that touches a little bit on that kind of fine line between support and research, which, which so it is very possible to kind of um, have a very successful career by traversing that line at different points. Uh, I, 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 as an example, I, I can tell you that in 16 years in academia, I've never had a short-term contract. I've always been on a permanent contract. Um, and that's because I've been able to deliver uh, on some level something that the institutions that are employing me need. And quite often, that is some kind of computational or bioinformatics support or running the research, running the sequencing facility, which I did for a short time, uh, and being able to deliver something to my employers that they absolutely needed and couldn't do without. Uh, and then, as a privilege, I got to do my research on the side. And I'm not saying that that research path is for everyone uh, and that everyone should pursue that research path, but I'd just like to highlight it as a valid research path for people to follow. Uh, as a bioinformatician, you will have skills that absolutely research institutions will value very, very highly for a whole whole range of reasons uh, and if you can you can exploit that to carve out a, a very secure and very happy career part of which sometimes the majority of which can consist of of, of research um, but you do have to be able to deliver what it is that those institutions want of you um, and delivery uh, a lot of which is, is writing but some of which is working with others uh, is a key part and I would, I would instead of um, I don't know if anyone is doing this, but if you are focusing and really thinking about which technical skills you need to learn, I mean, you know, technical skills come and go. Really focus on being able to, to, to deliver research projects, to deliver software, to deliver the skills uh, and, and, and uh, abilities that research institutions require of you. Uh, and that is a that is a path to uh, success in, in, in academia, in fact. So I'll, I'll finish there. Great. Um, thank you very much. Um, we have a couple of questions here. Um, so let me let me read the first one here. My personal experience: biologists are interested in solutions to their problems, but it is difficult to convince them uh, to consider developing algorithms. One simple exam example is primer probe design. Any suggestions, David? Yeah, I guess um, maybe the way I understand this question and it. It's in line with some of the, the, the notes I took. Um, so, as uh, Aidan mentioned, I mean, data analysis is very important. So, as a bioinformatician, I would do some data analysis for other people. Um, I might also, at some point, say, okay, I'm happy to do data analysis. I might end up writing some software because, you know, that helps me to do my, my data analysis. And as I just said, you know, maybe that software might even be useful to somebody else, which is. Mm -hmm. A great success. Um, but how do you have any advice? How can you transition from you know, doing data analysis for somebody to doing something maybe more substantial, more rigorous so, um, algorithm development and, and, and software uh, development? 
maybe you know something that as a bioinformatician I would value a little, little bit more to data analysis not that it's more important better but you know how to how to juggle these two um, you know how to deliver on multiple fronts anyone uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I can take that because I'm currently the unmuted um, uh, voice on the on the on, on the call. Um, I mean, I think w what happened um, it, certainly in various different aspects, uh, parts of my career is, you know, uh, you always are collaborating with people. You're always collaborating with wet lab people, and they have data, they have problems, and you can solve those problems. And sometimes it's a very simple solution, um, and that's fine. You can run that, and, and you can be a co-author. Uh, and deliver that. And sometimes it's just slightly more complex problems. And, and often the complex problems are the interesting ones. And um, the complex problems often present you with an opportunity to develop something that doesn't already exist. And I, I would always urge you to, if something, if a piece of software already exists to do uh, to do something, I would um, uh, try and use that piece of software. But often you will find that there are there are gaps in in the published software tools, uh, especially when you start working with new technologies. And I would urge everyone to always try and work with people who have access to new technologies because it's really exciting. Um, it gives you the opportunity to develop new software tools, new platforms, new algorithms, uh, and that's where you start carving out your name because those are your things. They're your algorithms. They're your software. You're the first or the last author, uh, and then all of a sudden, that's you building your platform. Uh, to carve out your own research, and you're using it to solve problems, but that's your thing, and that's a that's a kind of um, that would be my answer to that question. Um, I'd like to just add one thing. One of the papers that we had that was most cited was one where we compared methods, and um, particularly in a developing field where the data are new, or maybe there aren't many people working on it. Those papers can be very valuable in the field if you can think critically not just I want to analyze this data set, but how can I compare these methods and objectively test them? So coming up with a gold standard of some sort, whether that's a gold standard data set that you know that's in the field or simulating some data that you think would be a good test for many, many different softwares and then running those different um, algorithms through a pipeline that can actually be very, very valuable to people. So don't underestimate um, the time that you put into just researching what methods are out there, because that in itself is actually very valuable. And even if you don't come up with some mind blowing, well, this method is so much better than these other methods, if you can actually well say, well, these three worked good in this situation, and this one worked good in this situation, and say why, that's actually valuable. And I think that is a publication in itself for people working in these collaborative projects always have your ma mind on the least publishable unit that you might be able to actually publish for yourself and um, because that then develops your own career which is really really important when you're working in a collaborative environment so so i can add one more thing to the discussion of software i think we've come up with maybe four different kinds of products here um, one is the data that you're participating in as a computational biologist or, or bioinformatician. One is the data analysis paper, um, which is I'm, I'm a co-author, I help do some data analysis. Um, here are my scripts or, or whatever it may be. Um, another is I developed a new algorithm. Uh, you know, there was some need that wasn't being met by the current algorithms that are out there and I've developed it and here it is. Um, the third is uh, that I would distinguish from the algorithm development is here's a software package that I encourage other people to use and that I'm planning to support. And I, I view that as very different from coming up with a new algorithm. And it's a very different skill set. And it's also a real pain because as soon as you release <laughs> software that is useful to other people, they're going to ask you to support it. Um, and, and that can take away from other parts of your day on an ongoing basis for years. For example, Mick, Mick is currently asking for help with some software that I developed that he's using. And I'm in between traveling and getting on planes, I'm answering his issue comments on GitHub, right? And this is not a problem that I was planning to be working on during this trip, but um, it's something that we do in my lab. Uh, and then the fourth uh, is, I've now forgotten, um, uh, is the sort of methods and evaluation, which, and I really liked, I'm sorry, I'm going to mispronounce the name, it's Aiden, Aiden, um, which I think is tremendously valuable and really underappreciated, but the idea that you, that you take a data set that is, a biologic, that is biologically not boring, 
it may not be incredibly interesting, but is, is at least has some real world things in it and then evaluate a bunch of current methods, currently proposed methods on it, I think is something we need to do a lot more of um, and is, can be an incredibly valuable contribution. So I just completely agree with it. But I view those as all four different things that you can do and they have different trade-offs and, and implications for your career. And I think I published in all four areas. Um, and I would say that the one to be most, uh, to beware the most is releasing software that you expect, that other people expect you to support because there is no end to the support problem, the support challenge. So be careful if that, if you think that's what you wanna do, think three, three times before doing it would be my suggestion. Um, Bioconductor does help with that. If once you submit it, it makes it a lot easier submitting your software to making the little bit of effort at the start to make it compatible with them. But once it's submitted, they will update it every single time and it automatically gets into the next release cycle. That is something that's very, very convenient if you're doing software. On the other hand, it's also a sign of success if you have users, which not everybody can, can say. Um, we had another uh, question, um, and somebody was wondering if there are any specific differences in the skills or you know, how to train yourself as a bioinformatician for academia or industry. Um, <laughs> different skills. I mean, it, it is a different environment, right? I mean, academia, um, it's a different environment when you get to the leadership level, um, I guess. Uh, what I mean by that specifically is that in academia, um, as, as a leader, as a, as a PI, uh, you can pretty much choose to research into anything that you want to, as long as you can get funding to do it. And it's a very open, very exciting area. Um, in industry, obviously, things are a little bit more restricted. And I've certainly been in industry situations where people, uh, the rules have just changed and just say, we're not working on that disease anymore. We're working on this disease, and you're kind of told what to do. So certainly the leadership level is a little bit more restriction in industry. I'm guessing at the level beneath the leader, at the kind of at the postdoc level, I guess, either in industry and academia, you're kind of being told what to do a lot of the time anyway, whether you're in industry or academia or not. Um, I think, um, yeah, academia is a little bit more wild west. I mean, we can get away with stuff that, that uh, uh, there's perhaps a little bit more regulation in industry. There's a little bit more... Uh, a few more hoops that you have to jump through. You know, if you're going through software for clinical trials, for example, then you're going to have to jump through a lot more hoops than just releasing it on GitHub and hoping that it works. So, um, you know, it's a little bit more regulated in there. I, I think that also the, the regulation side of it also um, is seen in some academic environments. If you're working on nurses' health or framing and heart or any of these longitudinal trials or any of the clinical trials which many of the statisticians, bio, bioinformaticians work in, in Dana-Farber, they also have code evaluation and it's it's always tested. And I, I know several PIs in academia that also do code evaluation of their students and their postdocs. Um, I think that the barriers between academia and industry are less than what they used to be. I've seen several people that worked with me that have moved into industry and even moved back again. Um, I think no matter which environment you're in, good communication skills, good writing skills, good organization, good documentation of your code and good coding skills are always important. And also the math mathematical adaptability, the ability to actually find out which methods are good for the data rather than having a hammer and trying to apply the same hammer to every single nail that you find. Um, uh, another question that we have concerns training and do you have any suggestions on how to train students in particular those that don't have any formal background in the bioinformatics or any related fields? So, so this is something I'm particularly passionate about um, and, and, and we have a lot of experience running people through training courses. I, I, would, I would differentiate that from training. Uh, in the sense of the difference is, you know, what sticks and what doesn't stick. And um, I, I put some comments in the uh, Google Doc on this, but my sort of very brief statement would be, um, there's dipping your toes in the water and there's really committing. And I find that um, these short uh, boot camp style courses, uh, boot camp or, or um, 
just short intensive two-day workshops that, for example, the Carpentries run, which I'm a huge fan of. We, we're, we're members of the Carpentry community. We, we run those workshops ourselves, but we find that they have limited long-term impact. They're primarily useful for skills, polishing, and awareness. And that, um, and I've really found that the, that the only thing that really seems to work um, for taking people that are already research active and have strong biology skills and, and um, exposing them to some in-depth computational skills is to run a, a really intensive week or two week long workshop where they do nothing but com computing for that, that time and they really get immersed in the culture and the questions and the style. And we've been running a workshop like that for nine years now. We're running the ninth year of it this summer. And I would say based, this is still a pretty qualitative statement, we're still working on assessment, but we see about a 20 to 30% conversion rate. That is people that come in with little to no computational experience, um, three to five years later end up being first authors on primarily computational papers. Uh, and about 20%, 20 to 30% of the people that come through the workshop end up that way, is my guess. Um, but the latency is high, right? It's a, it's a three to five year delay for many of them. So those are the, that seems to be the trade-off. I haven't found any other way that works other than, you know, graduate program level immersion, which is much more time intensive and career intensive. And I should say they use those week, those week or two long, week long workshops as a way to get over that first one or two learning humps. And then from then we've found that they, they use Stack Overflow, they take Coursera courses, they do the carpentry stuff, they talk to the people down the hallway, they, you know, they really put a lot of time and effort into additional learning, but getting over that first hump is something that I think is, is really one of the biggest barriers. Um, uh, Aiden or, or Mick, any, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can um, add, add some stuff. I mean, I, I totally agree with, with Titus. And again, I've written a, a lot about this on, on my blog. Um, you know, there's kind of week-long training courses. Um, we run a few Edinburgh Genomics um, on, on all sorts of different um, uh, subjects. And they're really, they're just a taster. I mean, there's no way we can teach you everything you need to know in that kind of week. Um, and you just got to get your hands dirty. I mean, you got to kind of be passionate about it, um, not be scared. Uh, take the introductory courses, which will teach you a little bit about Linux, a little bit about the tools um, uh, uh, that, that are available, and basically just get your get your get access to uh, some kind of Linux-based cluster or Linux-based machine. Set yourself some problems, set yourself some goals, and just really get your hands dirty and start working with data that you're passionate about to try and answer questions that you really want answered. Uh, and kind of, you know, just spend some time, um, and it, it'll be 90% of the time things work, but the 10% of the time that things don't work, it'll be absolutely fantastic. You will feel like the most, you'll get the most amazing feeling when you ma finally manage to get it to work. And make sure you use Stack, Stack Overflow. Make sure you ask to use Twitter and use GitHub for support and all that kind of stuff. But uh, just get your hands dirty and try and get stuff done. It's a, it's a great way of learning. My favorite thing to set people to do is actually figure one from your favorite paper. So get a paper that you've read that you found interesting. Get it one that the data is available. Tell somebody to reproduce the figure. And normally do five papers because you may not be able to do it for each of them, but make a good attempt. And if you can do that, you will have learned what you need to do at the end of it. Um, like, I never say go on and like read this book or read this website or read this thing because people will fall asleep halfway through or get distracted on something else. But if you set a very definite goal, reproduce this figure. Um, it was a great like example that I learned from Vince Carey. It really is a good way to get people down and dirty with the data because they have to download it and they have to work out what to do. And it, I find that's the best way. Great, excellent advice. And um, very, very briefly uh, to wrap up, I would like to know whether you have seen differences in the way institutions, um, departments, companies or, or institutes, how they kind of approach or welcome bioinformaticians. So I don't know, a typical example, you have a biology department with kind of senior professors, um, and maybe, you know, in the beginning, they need somebody to analyze their data. But then over the years, have you seen that slowly, you know, well, you are examples thereof, but have you seen a kind of a more 
a wider change how people with computational backgrounds so somehow you know come up the ladder and are, are seen more more regularly as peers rather than people that will do the analysis or kind of more only technical um, technical support. Yeah, Titus. So I'm going to give you uh, an optimistic but slow take on this. Um, and I'm just going to say um, departments and universities are collections of people. And it would be a mistake to view them as a black box uh, that, that has a uniform response to, to this kind of thing. What I mean by that is I've seen departments um, uh, well, just my two experiences. I was hired into a department that didn't know they needed bioinformaticians, and then next gen sequencing came along. Right, my first, you know, Illumina came along the first year I was in that department, and by the end, the department was actually quite happy that I'd been hired. I would argue the administration above that at the dean level and so on was less clueful um, about that, and so that was an example that I would say didn't work particularly well, but but indicates that you know you can sneak your way in and then prove your value and, and maybe that works. And then the other way things seem to work is a few, a cabal in a department goes, we need this kind of person. Let's figure out how to hire them. And if they're the right senior people that can figure out how to convey that message upwards to the dean and to their colleagues, then they can go forth and do that. Um, so very rarely have I seen a situation where there's a top-down statement, we need more of this kind of people, hire them and make it work. That, that rarely seems to work. You need to have recognition within the, the department and so on that, that you need these people. And, and I think the promotion, the merit and promotion path is particularly challenging at the assistant professor level in that, especially in the situation where the department still doesn't know how to evaluate these people. Um, so that, that's my sort of academic perspective is that it's, it's about people and it's about interactions, but ultimately there's things that are out of your control that just have to magically happen for it to be a welcoming environment. I think if you look at sort of overall citations of papers, if you look at like the top 10 cited papers in any field, I think it was published in Nature a couple of years ago, like BLAST and Clustal are up there in the top 10. Methods papers do get cited. But quite frequently, I think within biology, within medical, within a lot of fields, people don't really see that these papers have value because quite often they're published not in nature or not in science or not in cell. Some people do publish in those fields, but a lot of people don't. And I think um, departments need to develop ways to actually give credit for these highly important papers in the field that receive a lot of citations that really are advancing the field, but maybe aren't published in the traditional high impact papers. Um, and I think, you know, there are ways that that, that um, maybe departments can do better. Mick, do you have seen any, any changes, any predictions about the future? Changes, yeah. I mean, uh, things have changed massively, I think. And I think, you know, this is, it, it comes down to leadership at, at the highest level. And I think if you're kind of looking at joining a department, um, have a look around, never be afraid of asking questions, have a look around, do they, do they tend to employ kind of senior level uh, computational folk or, or do they not? Uh, never be afraid of asking questions if you're if you're looking at, at kind of an interview situation. You know what's the future for bioinformatics and computational people? What is the career path here? You should never be afraid of asking those questions. And if they don't have good answers, then maybe it's not a good place to go. Um, and I have seen that things have changed massively. Um, the one thing the the one thing that hasn't changed, I think, is that bioinformatics and computational biology and statistical and mathematical skills are still in huge demand. Uh, uh, that hasn't changed in any way. In fact, it's got greater. So it's a, it's a great area to be in. There are some issues, but it's a great area to be in. And um, yeah, I don't see the demand going down anytime soon. And I think you know there's a real um, there's a real future because if you if you can't analyze large data sets, then in biology you're going to become unstuck uh, very quickly. So we are now bioinformaticians. I think now are really really important members of this community and um, you know, we're really enabling, uh, but we also have great ideas. So it's a great future, I think, for all of us. I have a quick comment. 
um, which is just to say that one of the, the sources of massive change, I think, is just the inevitable um, increase in the number of senior people who are bioinformaticians. So I know that uh, I've been writing, I've been starting to write, now that I'm tenured, I've been starting to write tenure letters for other people. Um, and you know, it's hard if you are in a merit and promotion situation, which is what we call it here at Davis, uh, and there's nobody that can contextualize what you have done. And I would just say that um, when I was going up for tenure, you know, Ewan Bernie had offered to be a letter writer for me. And he was able to say, I assume, um, something along the lines of, if you're a biologist, here's why you might care about what Titus does. Uh, and having more people like that is, is a big change that enables the kind of career advancement that Mick is talking about. And, and I think that that's, that's been a really big shift over the last 10 years. Great. Well, um, I think it's time for us to, uh, to stop now. It's, it's five, point, five past five. I would like uh, to thank you again, Aidan, Titus, and, and Nick, uh, for, for sharing your experience and your insights. I found it um, very interesting, and I'm sure the, the listeners did too. There are a couple of more questions, I think, on Twitter, uh, maybe on the Google Doc, and um, we'll try to, to follow up, of course, later on. But thanks again uh, for coming. So, and I couldn't get Google Doc link to work. Maybe it's okay. just me. Can you just check um, that? There is a working link on Twitter, apparently. And I'll post it again as soon as, as, as we hang up. Okay. Uh, but thanks again. And, um, well, hope to see you all here soon. Great. Thank you for everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.